So let's talk about three tips to improve your personal statements. Welcome to Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel with Katie Lee. All the best resources you'll ever need at Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel. Hi everyone, it's me, Katie Lee, CGC, and welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm talking about personal statements 101. And I know from a poll I recently did in my YouTube community tab that personal statements are the most challenging part of applications for most of you guys. So let's really dive into some tips on personal statements. Even though I'm calling this Personal Statements 101, the three big tips I'm telling you about today are going to be tips you can apply to your personal statements, whether you haven't even started yet, which that's okay if you haven't drafted one yet, that's all right. It's still only October or whether you're somebody who is just, you know, way more on top of it than I was and is on your second or third draft. Number one, brainstorming. This is key. This is probably the most important part of preparing to write your personal statements and writing them in general. You want to brainstorm um, scenarios, whether it's personal experiences you've been through, work experiences, volunteer experiences. You want to brainstorm situations you've been through that make you an amazing candidate to be a genetic counseling student and to become a genetic counselor. So what you should do if you're somebody who's not going to be applying for a while is you should be keeping a journal where you are in detail journaling after you have an impactful experience, you yourself or shadowing or observing a genetic counselor. You want to be recording those. If you're somebody who's applying for this cycle for 2022 admission and you haven't done this yet, you want to type up some of the most impactful experiences you've had or maybe some of the experiences where you've learned something, you did something wrong, you made a mistake, you learned from it, you reflected on it. Um, type up some of those experiences and type them up in detail, how they made you feel, how the patient or the person you were working with made you feel, that type of thing. I was going to try and think back to my prep for genetic counseling applications and some of the experiences I've had. But at this point, that was like eight years ago, and it's just too far back for me to be able to describe them in detail. So what I'm going to do instead is walk you through like what I might write down for an experience that I've recently had as a genetic counselor. Currently, I'm on maternity leave, but as soon as that's over, I'll be back at Seattle Sperm Bank, where I work as a genetic counselor who works with donors and recipients, so individuals or couples who are planning to use a sperm donor to try to conceive a baby. and. I can think of a lot of times where um, I've gotten some really kind compliments where people have told me, you are the first person who's listened to me in my whole journey. And they might say something like, thank you so much for explaining to me all of the different aspects that I should consider when I'm selecting a sperm donor. From things like, are they open ID? Will my child ever have the opportunity to find out who they are? To are they anonymous? To... Um, what does carrier screening mean for them? How are they tested? What about this in their family history? So that is what I would consider a relatively common scenario for genetic counselors. So I'm going to try and actually stay away from that when I'm brainstorming what type of experiences I want to include in my personal statement. Instead, what I'm going to think about is something that I grew from, a challenge, a a uh, mistake that I grew and learned from, which yes, as a genetic counselor, you still do make mistakes. So what I want to talk about for my personal statement is a time that I was working with a recipient couple. They were a lesbian couple and I had referred to the donor as a guy instead of donor one, two, three, four, five, or our donors also have aliases. Now, some recipients are really casual when, when referring to the donors. They might say, what do you think of this man? What do you think of this guy? And others, like this couple, were not. And I was not cognizant of my language that I was using with this um, recipient couple. And I had used the word guy twice. And one of the individuals I was on the phone with stopped me and she said, excuse me, but you using the word guy is, is really off-putting. These are donors, and we don't think of them as anything more than that. As a lesbian couple, I just... I would really prefer you refer to them as, as donors because that's what they are. They're sperm donors. And I was definitely caught off guard, but I was also so thankful that they gave me that feedback. One, so we could continue our session and build better rapport. And two, so I could learn from it in future consults and not make the same mistake again. So I would tend to lean towards that type of experience. And when I'm journaling about it on my Google Doc, I would one, set the scene or describe kind of what was going on. 
I was providing a routine genetic counseling consult over the phone for a lesbian recipient couple who was planning to utilize donor sperm to have their first child. And we were discussing carrier screening and family histories of the donor. I would explain the language I was using, the feedback I received from the recipients, and how I responded. And how I responded was by saying, thank you so much for giving me that feedback. I sincerely apologize for making you and your partner uncomfortable and for using the incorrect language. And I absolutely will use donor going forward. And I just really appreciate you giving me the chance to, to learn from you by you sharing that with me. And from then on, you could tell that the couple kind of breathed a sigh of relief and they were receptive to the way I responded. And this example illustrates my ability to receive feedback, to respond on the fly, it also, I think, is an important concept in genetic counseling right now where there's a lot of discussion about, um, you know, using the correct pronouns and how important language is when you're speaking with somebody for setting the tone and for, you know, showing your acceptance, essentially. And it can get you on the right foot if you, you do it correctly or you have a good attitude if you are corrected, or it can get you on the wrong foot if you don't even care to ask or you have a poor attitude when you're corrected or don't handle that well. So that would be an example of a, a story, an experience I might include on my personal statement. So what you want to do is sit down for a couple of hours or maybe even just one hour and brainstorm at each of the different roles you've held. What are some of the most impactful experiences you've had and what are they going to illustrate? You could also do it the other way and say, I want to illustrate that I'm compassionate. What are some experiences I've had that have demonstrated that? And you want to write up a couple paragraphs about each experience. So that's tip one is to brainstorm and write down experiences that illustrate why you are a good genetic counseling applicant and do it in detail. Tip number two is you need to answer the question. This is like the golden rule of all applications. Follow the instructions that are provided to you. Follow them to a T. Don't bother people with questions if the information that you're asking about can already be found on the website or the application packet. So same goes with personal statements. You need to answer the prompt that was provided. And you might think when you're taking a look at all of the prompts for the schools you'll be applying to that they're all kind of the same or they're all very, very similar. But when you actually take a closer look at them, they're not, they're not. They have different length requirements and some of them are very specific. Some of them ask you to address why you want to go to a specific program um, or throw in some additional questions and others are much more general, just like, explain why you want to be a genetic counselor. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few different prompts from different schools this year and talk a little bit about them. I decided to just pull up two different personal statement prompts from two schools that I happen to apply to. So the first we're looking at is Stanford. Stanford says the personal statement should succinctly describe your reasons for applying to the genetic counseling program, your preparation, your research interests, future career plans, and other aspects of your background and interests, which may aid the review committee in evaluating your aptitude and motivation. And you can see they only allow two pages and they prefer double space. So that is short, 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 especially when they're asking for all of these things. So what you want to be careful of, especially with a prompt like this, is that you could quickly kind of get yourself into writing something similar to a CV, essentially, and just putting sentences on it, because a lot of this is going to be information that you might find in a CV, what you've done to prepare, what your research interests are, um, your background and interests that aid you in becoming a genetic counselor. So you want to find a few things that you can focus on while you're still answering all of the questions listed out in their prompt. Now let's compare this to a different prompt. This is Minnesota's. Um, the University of Minnesota says, your personal statement can be four pages, double-spaced. They want to see in your personal statement that you reflect on experiences and apply what you've learned to your future as a genetic counselor by answering the following questions. How did you become interested in pursuing this career? What have your previous experiences taught you about your interest in genetic counseling and how have these experiences prepared you? So that was like kind of like that example that we went over um, you want to think about experiences that can answer this question. What does justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion mean to you? And how have your experiences prepared you to engage? So similarly, hopefully you have an experience you can think of 
that you could describe in detail that would answer this question. And then finally, I'd say a good number of schools ask, why is their program a good fit for you? And they want you to be specific about it. This is something you might need to reach out to current students about to figure out what's unique about the program that makes it a good fit for you. Sometimes you can find that out from a website, but speaking to someone who's associated with the program would probably be an even better way. So you really wanna go through these personal statement prompts and think about them. You want to understand what they're asking and be sure that you're answering those questions. When you are to the point of reviewing your first draft, your second draft, you want to go back and go back to these prompts and make sure you are answering the questions in detail. Make sure you haven't missed anything. You also probably wanna look at the website for each program and see if there are any focuses um, see if they talk about what type of applicant they prefer. Do they take a holistic approach? Are they looking for applicants with this or that? And see if you can highlight anything that they're looking for. So that's it. That's my second tip is to review these prompts with a critical eye and make sure that you're answering the questions. All right, finally, tip three for Personal Statements 101. Now that you have a list of all of these brainstormed experiences that you've thought about, whether they're from your personal life, whether they're from volunteer experiences or your job or shadowing, you've got this nice list of different experiences. And you've thought a little bit about what characteristics you want to highlight with those experiences. And you've also looked at all of the prompts for the schools that you're going to apply to, and you know what questions you have to answer and how many pages or words you have to answer those questions. So now what you're going to do is you're going to look at your list of experiences and those questions, and you're going to decide which of these experiences would answer this question best and would set me apart. Are any of these experiences the same experience that, you know, 50% of applicants have probably had when they were working at the crisis text line or volunteering at the crisis text line? If the answer is yes, that the majority of genetic counseling applicants have probably had this exact same experience, I wouldn't include it. I'd look for something more unique that sets you apart, whether it's, again, personally or more professionally. So that's tip three is review that list, review the prompts, and pick the experiences that are going to stand out most. All right, guys, I hope those tips helped. And if you're somebody who's already written your personal statement and you're thinking, ooh, that um, experience I, I wrote about is not very unique or there's other things that stand out more now that I think about it, think about reworking it. And also double check that you actually answer the questions in each of the prompts um, before you consider yourself done, okay? Next week, what I'm planning to do for Wannabe Wednesdays is to answer your questions. So I would love if you would write down in the comments section your questions you have about personal statements so I can answer them. Thanks for watching, guys. Let me know what your questions are and how your applications are going. I'm rooting for you. So keep up the good work.